there we go. We should be good then, Bev. There we go. Hi there. Hello, everyone. Um, like Emily shared, thank you for your patience. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we may be uh, aging millennials and millennials, but we still have struggles with technology. With that, um, we would like to welcome you to our first quick combo session. Um, and, and before we get started with today's session, we do want to provide you with a little bit of background on what quick combos is and what um, what our goal is with uh, with these webinar series. So these will be about 30 minutes. Um, they will be recorded and posted on our web page there. If you haven't already had a chance to check out our web page, uh, feel free to do that. You can um, find it on our homepage at www.nationaldairyfarm.com. And, um, and you can find all the dates for the upcoming uh, remaining five webinars in this specific series. And uh, we are expecting to have more additionally in the future. But the goal of these is an opportunity to answer dairy farmer questions straightforward and to the point. Um, we want an opportunity to interact with, with our dairy producers across the country. And, and this is the way that we have found that we can have direct interaction where they can submit their questions. Uh, unfortunately, today we did have a few technical difficulties and we're not able to stream it on our Facebook page. Uh, but going forward, we'll get those kinks worked out um, and then we'll be able to answer those questions directly um, on our Facebook page and be able to have have a larger conversation there. So just a few of those upcoming dates. Again, all of this information is on our webpage, so you don't need to jot these down or anything, uh, but there are Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll continue to be that way throughout this series. And so uh, there can be for the upcoming future. Um, next week, we will have another one at uh, on Wednesday at 1 p.m. And so tune into that where we'll discuss the farmer's role within the program and then those other program topics in the future. So with that, uh, we are excited today, Emily and I, to be here. Um, so before we get started, Emily, if you wouldn't take a moment or if you would take a moment to introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Emily Eiser Stepp. I'm the vice president of the National Dairy Farm Program. So in that role, I've been in that role for just over four and a half years now. Uh, as Bev will probably share, we've uh, we started together in 2016 uh, with the farm program. My background: I grew up uh, through in the dairy industry um, and started within the dairy industry. Really. Uh, with my grandparents being raised and on dairy farms in Maryland. Uh, my kind of journey to formal to the formal dairy industry was a little bit uh, unique in that I got my start within the dairy leasing program, but since then um, have dedicated my life since age eight to uh, to the dairy industry still have some, what I like to refer to as fluffy tail cows, uh, that thankfully Palmyra Farm in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland and Bull Creek Farm in Western Pennsylvania manage uh, for me day to day, but have uh, degrees from Penn State and Virginia Tech in animal and dairy science and have been in a variety of roles in my professional career from the AI industry to uh, the nonprofit and then joining National Milk Producers Federation in 2016, as I mentioned. So it's great to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, I think Bev and I can both agree, we'd much rather be able to see most of you in person at our normal meetings throughout the fall. Um, but hopefully this will prove to be a worthwhile uh, event for us and hopefully get us to connect with you guys um, in, a, in a new and unique way that we're all trying to adjust to here in 2020. So Bev? Thanks, Emily. And so one thing uh, we do as we encourage you to, to uh, submit your questions, we will have about 10 minutes at the end. And, and I know we're already a little behind to be able to answer those questions. That really is what we're here for. Uh, obviously, um, we have taken Facebook away for this session. So over on the left, if you're not familiar with the Zoom features, if you uh, hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see a black bar that pops up and you'll have the option to either submit questions through the chat function or the Q&A um, option there at the bottom and we'll be sure to get those uh, at the end. So with that, I think first and foremost, Emily, can you just explain what is the farm program? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a valid question and one that even in my day-to-day -day workings um, when we were doing Halloween here in our neighborhood, um, got a question, what do I do um, and what do we do? And I think, you know, more, more than anything, the farm program is in place to truly communicate 
those uh, assurances to our customers and our consumers, those dairy buyers, in addition to our everyday consumers, that they can feel confident that their milk and dairy products come from a good place. I think it's not, uh, it's not unusual now, and it's certainly become commonplace for people to want to know where their food is um, coming from, how it's being raised, um, and certainly that encompasses a lot of things that we kind of coin under the phrase of social responsibility. Uh, so it's not just animal care. The animal care program has been the, the foundational part of the farm program for the longest tenured uh, going on now, almost 12 years being in place. But it also includes those areas of antibiotic stewardship and more recently the environmental stewardship and workforce development. I think generally speaking, what we're trying to accomplish with the program is telling dairy's good story. Um, we certainly, because of and we'll get into some of this here in a, in a little bit of um, our relationship with the Dairy Checkoff organization. You know, a, a key component and key foundation of, of Checkoff is to, to encourage our farmers to, to tell their story. And we see that the farm program is really um, a, an essential piece of telling that story that can provide the data, the trust, the trust points and the verification. Um, to really bolster that storytelling process. And can you give us a little bit of background on, on why, how this program came to exist, the farm program specifically? Yeah, so in 2009, the National Milk Producers Federation and uh, Dairy Management Inc. came together and really took a hard look at what the industry pressures were occurring kind of in this consumer trust space. Um, Frankly, dairy was late to the table. Um, we have barnyard groups, our beef colleagues, our poultry colleagues, our swine colleagues have really been working in this quality assurance space for a very long time. Um, beef quality assurance has been in place for uh, decades now, having started in, in the early um, 1980s. And so in 2009, and that was really as I was kind of getting, showing my age, getting out of college, um, maybe some of you weren't even born then, <laughs> um, to, to understand where we needed to really kind of cut this off at the head and make sure that we were communicating what our dairy practices are from, from everything from animal care to environmental stewardship and now workforce development. Um, and so it's really not a program that's unique to dairy per se, but it is one that we have um, truly taken the bull by the horns of in the last uh, 11, 12 years. It's, we've been in place probably the shortest amount compared to our barnyard groups, but it is one that allows for us again to communicate those, those trust and proof points for our industry and to be on the proactive. I think a lot of times, and if some of your questions lead that way, um, it does feel like we're reactive a lot within agriculture as a whole. And this is an ability for us to get out ahead of some of those questions and those concerns that we know uh, that movable middle, those consumers and our customers are, are truly asking about how our animals are raised, um, what we're doing in the antibiotic space, what we're doing about the environment, what we're doing about our workforce. Thanks, and you spoke a little bit about EPCIT, but can you elaborate on, um, you know, is a program like this unique to dairy? What does it look like and for other species? How are they meeting those um, expectations from their supply chains? Yeah, I mean, and actually, Bev, you probably have the better perspective. Um, Bev comes from a pretty unique, uh, diverse livestock background. Um, there, This is not unique just to dairy. Uh, we are constantly in conversations with other barnyard groups and, and frankly, other animal, uh, animal groups. Um, and maybe Bev, this is a good time for you to share, um, but this is not unique to dairy. I think the questions are only going to continue. Um, and that, that true, I, I think I've heard the, you know, the phrase used in the past, but that radical transparency is something that current consumers and future consumers, it's table stakes. And it's something that we have to um, we have to promote, we have to put out in front of people. Otherwise, unfortunately, just the way that um, you know society is these days, that if they don't see it, 
um, for themselves, they're going to assume the worst. And so if we stay silent in some of these spaces that we really do need to communicate about in a proactive manner, they are going to assume the worst. And what we want to be able to do is give, uh, give our consumers a reason to stay in the dairy space. You know, I think uh, just last week we were, uh, you know, having the opportunity to kind of reflect on the past year during our National Milk and DMI uh, annual meeting and and dairy's not going away, but we definitely want to give people a reason to stay in the dairy aisle and feel good about the products that they're purchasing. But Bev, I think this might be a really good opportunity for you to share a little bit about the the other animal uh, groups that are needing to do the same thing, and and it's not just specific to uh, commodities that we consume. It's also commodities um, that involve animals and and land and workforce uh, kind of across the gamut. Yeah, uh, I would definitely add that um, providing those assurances to our consumers and our customers and our supply chain is certainly not unique to dairy. Um, I would say actually where dairy has the advantage is that um, that the reality is, is that our producers are involved in this process through our producer boards that approve, especially the farm program and the standards that come with our evaluation for um, our program areas that have evaluation. So workforce development and animal care and other species groups, um, auditing is the norm. Um, you know, whether it is an internal audit or an external audit, a customer audit, um, a third party, um, auditing or verification system. I, I think it's it's become the norm throughout all of our species. If you're looking at everything from pigs, you know, pork, poultry, mink, um, and so it's something that that is that we're seeing across the supply chain. You know, even in my world and in the exotic species and, and those livestock, we have APHIS that comes out and, and provides inspections as well. So this is not unique to dairy. Don't necessarily feel like that dairy is being picked on. It's just as that consumers and our customers that we rely on to give us what paychecks we do receive, um, we have to provide those assurances and answer those questions. And so this is the form that that has taken. So with that kind of uh, probably the biggest question that we receive about the farm program is how, how is farm funded? Where did the dollars come to support the program? Yeah, so farm is, uh, is actually, uh, we're facilitated out of National Milk Producers Federation, but we are fully funded on a contract with Dairy Management Inc. and the Checkoff Association. And that's mainly, there's two primary reasons for that. One, National Milk obviously is a, a trade association. Um, and so it does require membership of uh, cooperatives. And so while we represent close to 70% of the fluid milk supply in our national milk membership, we recognize there's a 30 plus, if not a little bit more of, of the milk supply that is not involved with national milk. And so by, by the way that checkoff is structured, the fact that every dairy farmer pays into checkoff, we, particularly as we started to roll out the farm program in 2009, recognized that we needed a unified approach to this arena of social responsibility. And so in order to do that, we needed this program to be available to all dairy farmers, regardless of who they market their milk through. And so by doing and having that relationship with Checkoff, it A, allows for us to provide resources and tools to our, our network of our dairy farmers, as well as our cooperatives and processors at no cost, because you all have already paid for it. Um, and in turn, provide again, that unified approach to all of these arenas of social responsibility. I think the other thing that maybe I forgot to mention <laughs> as to why this program started um, really in the early 2000s, we did start to see a lot of market fragmentation around um, companies, CPGs, customers wanting to create their own program. And simply the way that milk moves, um, as most of you are probably more familiar with than, than I am on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's not, we're not vertically integrated like, like swine, like chickens. Um, it's, it is a different animal legitimately, um, theoretically and, and legitimately. Um, and what that causes is because of the way that milk moves there, there was the potential that we would, we, our farms would be subject to five, six, 10 different audits, evaluation types of, of mechanisms to provide these assurances. And so to take some of that onus off of the dairy and really create a program that is created by and for 
the dairy industry. Um, I think we are unique and there are, I mean, admittedly, we've got some competitors in the social responsibility space, but we, uh, we pride ourselves in having that ongoing industry stakeholder engagement, starting at the farmer level, including the cooperative and processor, as well as those, those critical supply chain, but really the decision-making process rests in full with our farmers and our cooperative and processor staff. And then the, probably the, the second most popular question we get is um, how are decisions and, and who is allowed to make decisions about what the standards are in the farm program? Yeah, and Bev, I don't know if you have that slide to pull up. Great, thanks. Um, this is, I think, as Bev and I uh, were going around to different places throughout the last four plus years, um, this was overwhelmingly, this continues to be the question that is often answered. And really that's what we're hoping to do in these quick combos is give these snippets of, of information, help clarify anything that maybe some of those commonly asked FAQs have, have arisen. Um, but we really do, as a whole within the farm program work within this structure. And actually uh, this quick combo uh, concept idea really came together because of that, that bucket there that you see at, at the bottom of your screen, the Farmer Advisory Council. Our uh, three years ago, based upon feedback that we uh, got from a, a producer survey was really insistent that we get more farmer involvement within the governance process of the farm program and provide again more visibility and transparency in how the decisions are made, who's involved. So if you do have questions that you don't know how to get to, to Bev or myself or any of the rest of our farm staff that you do have access to those people. And so we start everything with the, with the Farmer Advisory Council, making sure that we are grounded in uh, reality, which is very helpful. Um, and again, as you know, my, my own little focus group uh, where my cows live and, and a lot of our collective friends and, and peers um, really do keep us grounded in that arena. But that Farmer Advisory Council is made up of 20 plus, 20 individuals, I guess now, um, farmers from across the country, varying co-ops and processor representation, varying sizes, varying management styles. We've got um, a small organic farmer from Vermont everywhere to the a very large you know, operation in Idaho and everybody in between. So we do really feel like we've gotten a really nice sub uh, subsection of the industry to represent and provide guidance and input as well as ambassadorship. So if you are interested as to who is on these different task forces or councils, please feel free to visit our website. We're happy um, to get you connected with uh, the people that you may be more familiar with at a local level. Um, and then that also feeds into our task force structure. So our task forces really um, do provide, again, very similar, that guidance, that input. They are the sausage makers of a lot of our program standards, but it does include more of a, again, a broader subsection. So it includes farmers, our co-op processor staff, um, as well as in particular in the animal space, you know, we, needed, we need veterinarians, we need the veterinarian community on board. Um, so we've got a, a vet demographic of that task force as well as some academics. Um, and I would say similarly for workforce and environmental stewardship, Nicole Ash, our, our colleague will speak more to those, but we're, these are really our subject matter experts that we uh, rely upon to do kind of the dirty work before it goes to um, our broader national milk committee structure. Um, so that's really where things kind of transition from uh, maybe everybody in the pool to that national milk governance structure. We've got different committees focused in on each of these various program areas. Farm is not the only thing that they focus on. They do also do policy work, um, particularly in the uh, in the environmental space, but also the animal health and well-being committee has a strong a need for regulatory um, insights and, and input. And then everything gets filtered up into the National Milk Board of Directors. And you can see there what our farmer representation is in each of those groups. Um, just recently, we have done additional outreach for uh, some of the, the a restructure of the Animal Health and Wellbeing Committee in addition to our animal care and antibiotic task forces. Um, so it's, it's not a stagnant group. We do have, uh, comes and goes, and we definitely try to make sure that as seats become open and available and that governance structure is, um, again, very 
fluid so that we can continue to get uh, the, the best and the brightest in those groups to really provide guidance and, and input for the program direction. Thanks. And I do have a few more questions. As a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A box um, if you have it over the bottom of your screen or that uh, chat feature there uh, so we can make sure to include your questions in some of these for Emily as well. I guess my next question would be uh, for you, Emily, is how do producers go about participating in the farm program? Yeah, so early on, uh, as, as the program was, was really getting underway, it was a little bit more piecemealed uh, than, it, than it looks like today. Um, so producers, are original, as, as in full, our farmers are involved and our participants um, based upon their membership with their milk marketers. Um, so if, they, if you are a member of a cooperative, that cooperative will be the formal entity that participates in the program. When they, as an entity, decide to participate, um, that then in turn subjects kind of the, the evaluation structure, depending on the, the different um, program area that they are participating in. As an example, if a co-op or a processor is a participant in the animal care program, there is the expectation, and you can see all the logos here, there is the expectation that those organizations evaluate 100% of their, uh, their membership on an, at least an, at one, once every three year basis. Comparatively for a farm environmental stewardship that's a little bit newer of a program area, there is a random sampling protocol that is to be followed so that we can get a, a perspective on the true uh, carbon footprint and GHG emissions as uh, a regional or within a specific supply chain. So it's a slightly different approach with environmental stewardship. And then also we do have workforce development as a, a formal program area within the farm umbrella uh, that's brand new. We got board approval on that starting uh, March of 2020, right before literally the world felt like it came crashing to a halt. Um, so that is, that is the structure of how farms participate. And so I think what, you know, a lot of times when Bev and I have conversations with farmers, A, it's, it's know who's making those decisions on your behalf. You are, um, you are member owners of, of cooperatives in particular for processors, make sure that you know who all is involved in making those decisions on the processor side um, for your milk market. And, and from there, I think that equips everyone with having a greater uh, line of sight into kind of where and how this participation really looks. You know, I think it is hard when, when you just see an evaluator once every three years to really understand kind of the, the nitty gritty pieces of everything and how those decisions are made. But again, if you're not sure who your board representative is within the national milk structure as a cooperative, or if you're if you're wanting to know, you know, if you are a participant that that ships to a proprietary processor, who um, who you need to talk to about the decisions that are being made for participation in programs like farm or other decisions, you know, based upon B two B relationships with customers, let us know. We're happy to make those connections with you and get you in touch with the right people. Thanks. And then we had a question that came in that asked, how is farm working with retailers and processors to ensure that environmental sustainability requirements are met to avoid duplication of efforts by co-ops and farms? That's an excellent question. And I think that's what, um, you know, what we've really been able to succeed within um, <clears throat> from at an animal care level. But in particular, this is really where the value and the relationship with Dairy Management Inc. with Checkoff has come into play. Uh, we have two dedicated staff people, Angela Anderson and Josh Luth. And Josh actually formerly worked for a, a cooperative in Wisconsin. Um, so he is well-versed and was our farm program contact at that cooperative. They manage and maintain those relationships with our, our customers to make sure that there is a dairy contact with those customers or CPGs, retailers, before any decision is made uh, that would impact the dairy industry. Now, again, there are, there are two people, right? So um, by, by and large, they are focused on the top 50 um, movers and shakers within the dairy industry, within that customer retail space. 
Uh, we feel very comfortable and, and particularly from the farm program standpoint, we have, I would say, a strong relationship, one where farm is the recognized go-to social responsibility program, in addition to if they have any questions, who they can go to, they reach out to Angela and Josh with about 80% of the top 25. Um, and then those, those next 25, Josh literally just started again, kind of as the pandemic started. So I don't know if there's a correlation there or not, um, but that uh, to, to really maintain the, the focus on that next 25. Um, and so ad admittedly, a lot, of, a lot of the environmental sustainability stewardship space is very dynamic these days. Um, and farm environmental stewardship is today a, a GHG and carbon footprint calculator what the focus I think collectively between the farm team in addition to the initiatives that we're working on with DMI, net zero initiative, 2050 goals, and everything else that encompasses sustainability is to hopefully maintain that the dairy industry has addressed the issues that, that are um, in our forefront, also positioning ourselves that as those additional pressures come up, we will have the response for them so that they don't need to look or try and differentiate themselves. It is truly, we feel as, as a program, and I feel like I, I'm speaking on behalf of the whole industry, that things like animal welfare, things like environmental stewardship, things like workforce development um, should not be competitive. This is a pre-competitive um, initiative that we wanna make sure that we're doing what's best for our farms and everything that is encompassed within the dairy space that again, everybody, a customer, a retailer can feel very confident within. Um, great question. Thanks. And we had another question that came in that was similar, but specific to animal care. So I don't know if there's anything you'd want to add specifically to animal care. Yeah, it's been an ongoing dialogue. I feel like that really um, our ability to communicate the the good that we're doing within the, the animal welfare space to improve consumer confidence is, is an ongoing dialogue. Um, this is really where that, again, that relationship with DMI as, as the checkoff organization, we kind of hand it off. We get it to the farm gate, we aggregate information and then share, hey, these are the good stories that we can be telling. Um, I just got an update last night from the strategic intelligence team that they are taking a, an even deeper dive and look into how we can do that in a more effective manner. Um, I think, again, a lot of times when there have been um, questions or concerns around the animal welfare on dairy farms, we do feel like farm ends up being a shield, being more of a defensive then it should be an offensive. And I feel like we are finally at a place with the program history, the, the notoriety um, and the integrity of the program that we can really start to push harder about being offensive, offensive um, not offensive, but offensive um, about what we're doing within the program and communicating that out more broadly. Uh, it's it, you know, we very much have also looked to our barnyard friends as to how, because they have longer standing programs in place, how they've accomplished this. Uh, and I would encourage you all, if you're interested, I think a really nice template that's been developed is on the beef side, our, our friends with Beef Quality Assurance and their relationship with, with their beef checkoff. Um, has been really something that we have kind of taken notes from and I think are ready to position ourselves to make moves in that way. So it's not, there's nothing definitive. I think great question, but nothing definitive to that. Um, but please stay tuned and something that will uh, continue. If you're not on our current list serves, we do have um, a specific kind of internal evaluator, our, our network uh, to communicate directly to those individuals involved with farm at the co-op processor level, but we also have a stakeholder newsletter that we provide quarterly updates and that would be um, another area to get involved. Additionally, if you are um, a customer retail, CPG, kind of that arena, um, please contact us and we can get you more in touch with um, some of our initiatives within the Dairy Sustainability Alliance uh, and the Innovation Center with DMI. Thanks. And then our last question asks about where to find more information and to uh, contact us. So if you want to hear just a little bit more about how folks can do that. 
Yes, and I think, um, again, we were a small but mighty team, we feel like, with the farm team, but that also makes us hopefully very readily accessible. And because we are not getting on planes, trains, and automobiles these days, uh, we are even more readily accessible to be contacted. Uh, please, please, please feel free to reach out to us uh, either via the various social media channels. We are on Facebook, Twitter, not overly active on Instagram because we have tried to reserve that for when we're out on farms, um, which hasn't been a whole lot recently. Um, but please feel free to reach out to us there. Uh, our handle is the farm program. Again, our, our website has a plethora of materials, information that you're looking for. If you can't find something on the website, or even if you just want a more direct line, please feel free to email us at dairyfarm at nmpf.org. That goes to our general farm inbox. Our, uh, pro or our information systems manager officially is his title, Tyler Knapp, who's on this call. He does um, manage that, that inbox and will get the, the questions that you may have um, directed to the right person within the team. Um, but also, you know, please feel free to, to chime in uh, over the next few weeks as you may have questions and um, we're, we don't want to we want to have these conversations. That's why we're doing this. We want to have these quick convos and hopefully get any further questions answered and connect you with the right people uh, on the various topics that you might be interested in. So that's anything else, Bev, that maybe I'm forgetting that way. No, I think that's it. Uh, we want to uh, apologize again for our technical difficulties earlier um, that we'll definitely work on before next week. Uh, thank you for those folks who were able to join us. As a reminder, we do have our next uh, convo will be next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. This a conversation will be recorded and we will either um, do another Facebook Live or we'll upload this video to Facebook. Um, so that more producers and farmers can um, add some questions as well. And with that, uh, thank you guys, and we will see you next week.